now what you are here to see. Juan Gonzalez has been a journalist for more than 30 years, a columnist for the New York Daily News since 1987. Uh, New York Daily News, a great newspaper in conjunction with another great newspaper based here in Seattle. Uh, he is also the co-host of the award-winning daily radio and television news program, Democracy Now! We have any Democracy Now! fans in the audience? <laughs> um, a couple folks are here from Democracy Now! with some information and some flyers and I think some sign-up sheets if you'd like to learn more about Democracy Now! If you don't know it, they'll be with uh, Juan afterwards during the signing. Uh, he is... Uh, uh, the two-time recipient of the George Polk Award for commentary. He's a founder and past president of the National Association of Hispanic Journalists and the author of numerous books, including Harvest of Empire from 2000, Fallout from 2002, and News for All the People, which was chosen as one of Progressive Magazine's best books of 2011. He'll be joined uh, in conversation with two, tonight by two unique Seattle voices. David Rolfe is the president of SEIU 775 Northwest, the fastest growing union uh, in the Northwest. He is the founder and chair of the SEIU Healthcare Training Partnerships and serves as an international vice president of the Service Employees International Union, the international union which represents more than 2.1 million workers in the United States, Canada, and Puerto Rico. He serves on SEIU's Executive Committee, Finance Committee, Organizing Committee, and Healthcare Board. I don't know if there are any other committees on that <laughs> union, but I'm sure he would serve on them too. Uh, Frank Blethen, who will also be on stage tonight, uh, has been the publisher and chief executive officer at the Seattle Times since 1985, having joined the family business full-time in 68. He joined the Seattle Times-owned Walla Walla Union Bulletin in 1974 as publisher and returned to the Seattle Times in 1980 and held executive positions in circulation, advertising, marketing, and labor. In 2011, in recognition of Frank's leadership on behalf of quality journalism, he was the first publisher to be awarded the American Society of News Editors News Leadership Award. They are here tonight to discuss Juan's latest book, Reclaiming Gotham, Bill de Blasio and the Movement to End America's Tale of Two Cities the subject of tonight's talk. Please join me in giving a warm town hall welcome to Juan Gonzalez, David Rolf, and Frank Wethen. Uh, good evening to everyone, and thanks for coming out. And I, I have to tell you, I've been on the road now for two months with this book as it came out September 5th, and this is my last out-of-town trip. <laughs> and and uh, I told the publisher two months, that's it. i got to get back to doing other things. So I'm glad to be here in Seattle, and I'm glad to uh, be here with two such distinguished fighters. Now, I don't know. You, I don't know if you all in Seattle appreciate uh, the role that uh, Frank Blethen has played uh, in the commercial and corporate media industry in America. Uh, I know that in any town, people always love to disagree and be angry with their own local newspaper. Uh, and uh, so I'm sure that there are some critics and well, as well as supporters of some of the stuff the Seattle Times uh, does. But, uh, I first met Frank back in 2002 and three when I was president of the National Association of Hispanic Journalists and we were trying to stop the Bush administration and their FCC commissioner, Michael Powell, from, um, uh, from totally allowing the commercial media companies in this country to run amok in, con in, in media concentration. And, uh, and Frank uh, Bethan was one of the few voices among publishers in America who stood up and said, this is wrong, this is not the way the journalism has to be practiced in America, uh, and we have to stop media concentration. And he took a lot of heat for it. I know that ASNI gave him an award, but that was sort of like, they, they gave him an award, you know, you give an award sometimes to somebody that you wish they'd shut up. Uh, and I think that, <laughs> that uh, that the reality is that uh, many of the of the editors and publishers were furious that uh, Blethen kept raising uh, these kinds of issues, uh, and so I was proud to work with him and to try to be able to 
do something, and we managed to stop, thanks to the, some federal court decisions, a lot of the media concentration uh, maneuvers of the Bush administration. Uh, and of course, David Roth is, is legendary for having been spearheading and winning uh, the first uh, $15 an hour uh, uh, minimum wage of any major city uh, in the United States. And uh, of course, that's a movement that swept the country. All right, let me tell you quickly why I wrote this book and what it's about. And then we're gonna have a conversation. I guess that, that Frank is gonna throw tough questions at us here. Uh, I've been a professional journalist actually for 40 years. <laughs> Uh, and uh, working in the commercial and corporate media, I retired in May of 2016 uh, after 29 years as a columnist at the, at the Daily News. And before that, for about 10 years, I was a, a community activist, labor organizer, and uh, so I spent the last 50 years, really, uh, with a front row seat to what is going on in urban America. And I've written a bunch of other books on other topics, but as I was getting ready to uh, retire, I had to try to like uh, say to myself, hey, you've been reporting on cities for all these years. What's actually going on? And what significant changes are occurring in urban America today? Now, I've been lucky to have worked in what I call the three great streams of American journalism. Uh, one is the, corp the one that most people associate with the media, which is the corporate or commercial media. Uh, the, uh, the, that's the one that everyone loves to hate, you know, and, and or, or to be furious at. Uh, and I worked at the Philadelphia Daily News for several years, at the Suburban and Wayne Times in Valley Forge, Pennsylvania, and at the, uh, and at the uh, New York Daily News. However, that's not the only, the only media's uh, section of the media that provides context or news and information to the American people. There's also an alternative press, a dissident press, a non-commercial press that has existed in the United States really almost since the founding of the country, going back to the working men's press of the 1830s, the great muckrakers at the turn of the century, Lincoln Steffens, Ida Tarbell, Ray Standard Baker, uh, uh, Upton Sinclair, all these uh, all these folks that exposed uh, the 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 great uh, uh, the great inequities of the robber barons and the monopoly trusts, uh, going through the through the new left newspapers of the 60s and 70s up to the progressive bloggers of our time. There's always been an alternative or dissident press challenging the existing narrative of the commercial and the corporate press. And I've been lucky to have worked in that stream, which the most representative of which obviously is my 21 years as co-host with Amy Goodman uh, on Democracy Now. But, but, there is, but there is a third stream of the press in America that rarely gets much attention, which is the press by people of color. Because for over 200 years, both the corporate and commercial press and the dissident press systematically excluded African Americans and Latinos and Asian Americans and Native Americans from participating in the narrative, in reporting the news and giving people a sense of what was happening. So we had to create our own press. Uh, 1827 Freedom's Journal, John Russworm, Samuel Cornish, uh, lead editorial, we wish to plead our own cause. Too long have others spoken for us. From the press and the pulpit, we have suffered much by being incorrectly represented. March of 1827, you could write that today. Uh, so there, and uh, the, from the Cherokee Phoenix in 1828 and Golden Hills News, the first Chinese newspaper in, in San Francisco in 1854, all the Latino papers that developed in the 19th century, there's been a separate press of people of color that's told a different story. And I've had the opportunity to work in that press as well. Uh, for years, I edited a Spanish language newspaper in, uh, in Philadelphia. And, uh, and before that, when I was an activist, I was one of the first editors of the Young Lord newspaper, Palante. So, uh, so that, uh, so that uh, I participated in all, I believe, all the three streams of the press in America. And so I have a much, I believe, clearer sense of how the narrative gets told. So what happened? In 2013, I'm working at the Daily News, and this young guy named Bill de Blasio, there, who was, had been a city councilman, is a former supporter of the Sandinistas in Nicaragua. He'd come up, he, uh, he's, he's from uh, a product of parents who were targeted during the McCarthy era for being, uh, they weren't really 
he wasn't a red diaper baby, he was a pink diaper baby. His parents were like li liberal Roosevelt, and his mother was, had sympathies for the Soviet Union, uh, but really was not, was not uh, a communist in that sense. But they were targeted, and so he developed with this sense of his, uh, from his parents, of a, a sense of justice that he tried to, uh, to organize around, and eventually goes into Democratic Party politics, runs for office, nobody had, gave him a chance. Four other people had more money, uh, more name recognition in the Democratic Party, and he somehow won uh, the Democratic primary and then swept to a 74% victory, 74% uh, of the vote in the, in the general election in November of 2013. And um, he ran on a program that income inequality was a moral issue of our time, and that he was determined to use the levers of government in New York City to affect some kind of change in the growing wealth disparity in America. Uh, somehow, post-Occupy, post-Great Recession, that message uh, pulled the voters out, and he won going away. Uh, now that in itself would be an, uh, noteworthy, because New York is, after all, the most influential city in the United States. It's the center of the world financial <laughs> system. Uh, it employs 300,000 people directly, not indirectly, <laughs> directly employees of New York City government, 300,000 people. Uh, and uh, it had a budget in 2013 of about 72 billion. It's now up to past 80 billion and change. That's bigger than most countries uh, in terms of annual budget. Uh, so that in itself would have been remarkable. But when I began to look around, I said, wait a second, it's not just Bill de Blasio. Uh, in that same November of 2013, a young maverick city councilman who'd been fighting the Democratic Party establishment in Pittsburgh for years, ran for mayor and won on essentially similar platform to de Blasio, uh, Bill Peduto. Up in Boston, a guy by the name of Martin Walsh, a union leader, cobbled together an alliance of African Americans and Latinos and labor unions and became the first labor union leader elected in, uh, to, to the mayor to your Boston, same November of 2013. Up in Minneapolis, a young nonprofit uh, executive who had made a name for herself fighting against uh, uh, the subsidies that the Minnesota Vikings wanted for a new stadium uh, uh, named Betsy Hodges ran for mayor and she won. Uh, before, even before them, uh, a, uh, a, a, a green uh, candidate in Richmond, California, Gail McLaughlin, uh, had won uh, had won the mayoral first city council and then the mayoralty. Uh, in, uh, right here in Seattle, in the same November of 2013, uh, you had uh, uh, Mr. Murray and you had Shama Sawant, uh, both running uh, uh, and both agreeing to support, well, Shama was really spearheading it, but, uh, but Murray went along with it, uh, the, uh, the $15 an hour campaign. Even before all of them, the most radical of them all, uh, Chakba Lumumba, a, a, one of the leaders of the Republic of New Africa, an avowed African-American revolutionary, ran for the mayor of Jackson, Mississippi, the capital of Mississippi in the deepest part of the South, a black revolutionary, and he won. <laughs> he won the mayoral race. Nobody thought he had a chance. A few months later, in Newark, New Jersey, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in early 2014, Ras Baraka, the son of the great African-American poet and revolutionary Amiri Baraka, runs for mayor of Newark and he wins. You know, an old time journalist once told me, you know, Juan, once is an incident, twice is a coincidence, three is a trend, <laughs> right? And what I saw in November of 2013 was that something appeared to be happening in America there was this new resistance movement of, of centered around income inequality, police accountability, uh, um, uh, renewable energy policies, uh, the fight for 15, sanctuary cities. All of these candidates had similar positions on all these issues and of course affordable housing. Uh, the, the, the need to build affordable housing in much greater numbers in these cities were building them. So I said to myself, this didn't just happen. 
somebody needs to look at this and try to figure out how this develops. So I figured I'm getting ready to leave the Daily News. I have some extra time. Let me go around the country and start interviewing people and trying to figure out what had happened. And so the book really tells the story of a new urban resistance that really started about 10 to 15 years ago in council races around the country, but really came of age in 2013 when all these mayors suddenly began to capture major cities across the country. Uh, and, um, and it tells the stories, you know, I mean, I, you know, I told the story of uh, your, uh, your own Nick Licata, who's no longer on the council, but who was one of the early, the early mavericks and, and leaders of, of, of this, uh, this new progressive movement, of um, Helen Gim in Philadelphia, who led a battle to prevent uh, Mayor John Street from building a new Philadelphia Philly Stadium in the heart of Chinatown. They would, have they would have destroyed Chinatown in Philadelphia just to build the Phillies a new stadium. And she led the fight of the uh, Asian American co uh, community of uh, Philadelphia to stop that. And then the next mayor, Michael Nutter, tried to build a casino in Chinatown again. And they fought it and stopped it again, and then she got elected to the city council. And, and so I talk about all these folks in Austin, Texas, and uh, in, um, in Philadelphia, in Minneapolis, and, uh, and I try to basically flesh out the story, not only, and it's not just a question of the United States. Uh, in England, Sadiq Khan is the first Muslim mayor, very progressive uh, leader, the first Muslim mayor of London. Uh, in France, Anne Hidalgo, a, a socialist and leading environmentalist of Europe, is now the mayor of Paris. In Spain, uh, Ada Colau led a movement of homeowners who were all being evicted from their homes after the great mortgage meltdown in Spain and thousands of people were losing their homes. She led a resistance movement. She is now the mayor of Barcelona. And, uh, and a young woman who nobody had heard about, when I wrote about her in the book, but now everybody's heard about her since the hurricane hit uh, Puerto Rico, Carmen Julín Cruz, who, uh, who led a grassroots movement in 2012 to become elected mayor of San Juan, Puerto Rico, and just got reelected last November. So what I basically am trying to say is that this whole movement has developed uh, and it's not gotten much attention. It's not even seen really as a movement uh, because people think the movements are uh, only uh, protests in the streets. Well, the protest, all of these folks came out of these protest movements. They were catapulted into office by the activists of these uh, movements. But at a certain point, when you want to make change, you have to govern. <laughs> You have to seize the apparatus of government, government and show how it can be transformed. Uh, and uh, and uh, so I also try to deal with what have they done and what, haven't, what have they not done? Uh, because a lot of people make a lot of promises but they don't necessarily deliver. Uh, and uh, power becomes an aphrodisiac and it's easy to get deviated and, and, and go astray. Uh, and also, the activists sometimes expect too much. They expect that everything will be, will be implemented immediately. Uh, in a capitalist society, that's not realistic. You know, you can get some things done, but there's too many other forces at play. You have to negotiate and deal with all the other forces. So that's basically the story of the book. It's the story of the new urban resistance movement in America uh, and, uh, and how the cities are our only hope. Because in all of these countries, in France and England and Spain and the United States, uh, the national governments and the regional and state governments are increasingly in the hands of conservative and backward looking political forces. The cities are going in a completely different direction. The cities are the only hope for, so, for progressive social change in the future. Uh, and, uh, and the cities are where the people are. 50% of the planet lives in cities. In another 20 years, 70% of the planet will live in cities as more and more people gravitate to the cities of every country. So really what the policies that are developed in urban areas are really gonna be critical to what kind of society we live in in the 21st century.
So I'll leave it there and let turn it over to, to, to Frank to ask uh, both of us questions and uh, hopefully have a good conversation. Thank well, you. Thank you, Juan. Uh, the book, I... I've had the pleasure in the last few days of working my way through the book, and, and believe me, it, it's very thought-provoking. Uh, and one of the questions I'm going to have for these two men is, uh, when you look at root causes, I think de Blasio nailed it, income inequality. At the end of the day, we're seeing the uh, fault line on income inequality and opportunity going the wrong way probably as large as it's been, certainly in anybody's lifetime in, in this room. Uh, and that is, you know, when you're in the wrong side of the fault line and you're more than 50% of the population, your kids aren't getting educated, you don't have opportunity, you're, you're, you're losing your job, you've got to take a lower paying job, I mean, you don't see any hope. Um, and one of the things in my mind that that gets back to is, is this focus we all have on Trump. I mean, Trump is an easy target, but we have to ask ourselves the question, how those fault lines get so big that half of America would actually elect somebody like Trump? And then we got to start thinking, how do we work on those fault lines and, and shrink them? You know, David Rolfe clearly has some uh, a desire to try to start closing some of those fault lines in the Seattle area. One of the questions I'm asked, Dave, sort of a dual question is, um, $15 an hour, you know, is it progressive? Is it going to be effective? Will it start closing some of the fault line? And the flip side of that is uh, if $15 an hour works, what does it matter if the Seattle schools are not educating 50% of their kids and the racial fault lines in Seattle, especially in the schools, are getting, <coughs> are getting worse and worse? So David, there's a simple question. So I will try to do that question justice, Frank. And I just, because, Juan, you mentioned Councilman, former Councilman Nick Licata, the audience just know he's joined us in the front row, along with Lisa Herbold, a current member of the Seattle City Council. Um, delight, delightful to have you both here tonight. I mean, I, you start with sort of this question of Trump and the polarization and the degree to which income inequality has driven um, upheavals Right. Some predictable, in some ways you could argue that the fight for 15 is a more predictable reaction to income stratification and wealth stratification than the election of Donald Trump, who by all intents and purposes intends to make it worse. Um, but if you sort of think about what happened to our country, right, between the late 1970s and today, we redistributed $2 trillion per year approximately 12% of our gross domestic product upwards every year for about 40 years. So we took uh, the $1 trillion or so of the labor share of GDP that was per year, in the, as the, which is in normal English, the part of the nation's income that workers earn. And about a trillion dollars of that got moved away from workers to the owners of capital in the distribution of our gross domestic uh, product between the late 1970s and today, per year. About another $1 trillion got moved from ordinary workers, like almost everyone in this room who earns a salary as, I don't know, a city employee, a librarian, a software engineer, just some job, to the super elite income earners, C-suite executives for Fortune 500 companies, their highly paid lawyers, their highly paid specialist doctors, athletes, entertainers, essentially the people who technically are salary earners, but they're not like the rest of us because their incomes are in the stratosphere. So $1 trillion per year every year, 40 years, from labor to capital, another trillion dollars per year every year, 40 years, from normal labor to super labor, to the top 1% of salaried, and then you wonder what that does to a society, right? You say, okay, well, if you were an honest conservative in 1975 and you really believed we would become more prosperous and have a, a, a more broadly shared prosperity if we deregulated, detaxed, privatized, globalized, imposed austerity, got rid of the unions, got rid of private sector retirement savings, transferred health care and education and housing costs away from large institutions onto individuals and consumers, you now have a 40-year laboratory test of trickle-down economics. 
and what you can judge for yourself whether it resulted in more broadly shared prosperity or not. So I think that when we look at the volatility that Frank talks about, the tr you know, we can say, all right, like, did this experiment work well for politics as usual, or did it produce giant swings of opinion and large numbers of people not even participating either in politics or the workforce anymore? That's one set of questions I think we should look at. Um, you know, I look, you know, when we first started talking, I remember weeks before the very first group of Brooklyn fast food workers were about to walk out on strike, and very few people knew that. I was in a room of labor leaders meeting with someone I guess I would describe as an exceedingly high-level White House official at the time, who cautioned, uh, and, and my colleague from Chicago who knew this person from when they were both younger, said, what do you think about uh, $9, $10 federal minimum wage? And this White House official said, oh, that would kill the recovery, it would hurt small business. A democratic, high-level government official was essentially parroting the trickle-down uh, economic uh, themes that they've been hearing again and again. So a lot of people told us we were actually crazy for demanding 15. Now today in Seattle, we very well know that we were now a bunch of us who were involved in 15 are looking back and saying, why did we shoot so low? <laughs> because with what's happened to the cost of living, um, and, and, and by the way, the market's actually exceeded 15 right now. The head of the Washington Restaurant Association told me late last year that, or earlier this year, that the going market rate, if you know how to cook an egg to order, is $22 an hour. And there's a sandwich shop on my, uh, right, on, on Third Avenue that says we're now hiring $20 an hour for delivery people to deliver sandwiches. So I think, to your point, Frank, I know the, um, you mentioned education. The number one determinant of educational outcome is parental poverty. And you look at teacher quality, you look at classroom size, you look at charter schools, public schools, you look at any variable you want. The number one thing that determines how well a child's brain will develop, not just how well they do in first or second grade, but the area of developed brain mass by the time they turn four is different based on whether their parents were in poverty. So as I think about this $2 trillion transfer of wealth, the resulting uh, political volatility, and you know, as we think about what really would make us a progressive city, I, I think we have to grapple with some of the same thing Juan talks about in the book. How do you translate street activism and inst inst institutional power and institutional power into real governance? And I would just say to my friends and brothers and sisters on the left, we shouldn't shy away from those questions of, like education that are hard to grapple with in progressive cities and be, uh, you know, very clear that we need to be very outcomes focused and be willing to maybe slaughter a few traditional sacred cattle if we're gonna really achieve progress. Those are some opening thoughts, I guess. Yeah, on the, on the, the issue of, the, of um, how you can actually affect um, this huge disparity. I give, I give examples in the book of what has, what has the Blasio's reforms actually done. And you know, people like data. You know, these days, everyone wants to, everyone wants to see the data, the big picture. So I, so I, I give them some data, right? Uh, and uh, I quantify the reforms, and uh, and I, I start with like within the first three months, uh, he, he and the city council, because it's not just a mayor. He had a progressive city council. He had an even more radical public advocate. It was a coalition uh, that uh, that really ran the entire government. Uh, with, I think by March or April of, of 2014, they they'd, uh, introduced uh, earned sick time, one week, 500,000 workers, low-wage workers in New York, could not have, did not take, did not have the right to call in sick or if their kids got sick uh, and they had to stay home without being docked pay. And uh, th they, uh, they got 500,000 more people covered by one week's uh, sick pay. Uh, that translates into on the average, and you know, the economists do the numbers on the, you take about three days of the five actually, most people. It, it came out to about $500 million uh, and that, it, that's a wealth transfer from the employers who didn't have to pay that before to the workers who now had that benefit. Uh, the rent, uh, rents in New York City, there's 860,000 apartments 
in New York City that are privately owned but rent regulated by the city. The city has to decide every year what percentage increase the landlords can, uh, can uh, institute for their tenants. For 40 years, the average increase, annual increase, for rent stabilized apartments in New York City had been 3.2%. Sometimes it was seven, sometimes five, sometimes one. The average was 3.2%. In the first three years of the Blasio administration, when he got control of the Rent Guidelines Board, first year, 1%. Second year, zero. Third year, zero. Three years, the first three years of the administration, one third of a percent increase compared to the 3.2% annual increase that they were accustomed to getting. That's why for two years straight, you could not turn on the television in New York City in the evening without seeing an anti de Blasio ad by the landlord lobby <laughs> because they lost $2.1 billion in those three years. You can, you can calculate it, just do the math. What's the average, what's the average rent, rent stabilized apartments? What would 3.2% over three years look like versus 1% uh, over three years? Uh, $2.1 billion. Uh, uh, universal uh, universal pre-K. Universal pre-K, the first year, 53,000 students uh, entered full day universal pre-K. Second year, 70,000. Third year, 70,000. That's 70, 70, 140, 53, 193. That's not just one year of education added to a child's uh, a school year. That's $10,000 a year each of those parents saved in childcare costs. Right? Every one of those parents saved uh, $10,000 a year in childcare costs. That comes to another $1.4 billion. Then there are the, the uh, labor contracts. For five years, teachers in New York City had not had a contract or a raise. Uh, policemen and firemen, three years, and uh, nobody had had contracts. Everybody was expired and no one had had a raise uh, in the last uh, period of the Bloomberg administration. Within months, the city negotiated fair labor contracts with all the workers, gave them back pay, uh, and then t did a, a payment plan <laughs> uh, on some of the stuff, but actually uh, agreed to settle all the contracts. That was worth $17 billion dollars over three years. Now, those city workers did not put that money in the Cayman Islands. <laughs> they didn't put it into a real estate investment trust in uh, Los Angeles. They spent the money right in New York City. And so de Blasio's position was if you raise the bottom, it, there's, a, there's, tr there's trickle down and there's trickle up. <laughs> right? If you raise the income level of the bottom, the city will prosper. And that's exactly what has happened. New York City has more jobs today. Uh, it has, uh, the crime rate has continued to go down. The tourism is at an all time high. It's about 55 million people visited New York City last year. So a million people, more than a million people a week visit the city, right? Uh, and uh, so t tourism is up. You know, the, the economy is, is booming better now. There's still wealth inequality, but it's now beginning to shrink. And I, I'll tell you one story. De Blasio was at the first protest in over $15 an hour. And uh, in, uh, in the first strike that was held, I think it was Thanksgiving weekend, 2012, something like that. And um, so he started pushing $15 an hour, but he knew that was gonna be tough. And so he got Andrew Cuomo to agree to push for $13 an hour uh, in, uh, for New York State, but then Cuomo reneged on it. And so I, on the promise, so, so I, uh, I did a column in the Daily News one day blasting Cuomo for reneging on his promise, and the governor's office calls me up, the governor wants to talk to you, and, 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 and Andrew, and the governor starts saying, that f fucking working families party, they don't represent anybody. $13 an hour is going nowhere in Albany, it will never happen. And I said to him, well, governor, I don't know about $13 an hour, but $15 an hour sweeping the country. <laughs> you know, more and more people are getting onto the $15 an hour bandwagon. Uh, and as, uh, especially once Bernie Sanders got into the campaign and uh, Andrew Cuomo realized that positioning himself as a centrist Democrat 
was a death knell <laughs> for anybody hoping for presidential, uh, for, for presidency in the future. Suddenly, Andrew Cuomo switched. And he went from saying that $13 an hour would never happen to becoming the champion of $15 an hour and actually getting the state government to pass it. Right? So it was the pressure of that uh, of you folks out here it's sweeping across the country. It was the de Blasio pressure from New York City that suddenly the governor changed. You know? And so I think that uh, that shows that you can raise income levels you, and doesn't hurt the economy necessarily. Uh, and I think that um, that's a harbinger of positive change for the future. On the public school thing, quickly, that's a tough one. Uh, uh, there's a whole bunch of cities in America that have been, their public school systems have been taken over. Ras Baraka fought to, uh, because the Newark, New Jersey state government took over the Newark public schools. Pennsylvania government took over the Philadelphia public schools. Uh, all of these cities where African Americans and Latinos were uh, the majority population, there have been state takeovers go going on for years and nothing has happened. Nothing has happened in terms of improving the quality of education. So it's not, it's not simply a, a restructuring of the public school system. I, I agree with Dave that it's a question of, it's a function of uh, the, the systemic poverty in America. It's a, it's a function of, um, uh, of uh, the, the lack of investment in public education, because I do think uh, small, uh, small classes are a big indicator of, of uh, uh, increased uh, achievement of students, it helps to have smaller classes uh, because um, that's why all the private schools have smaller classes, <laughs> you know, but the public schools have bigger classes. So I think that, um, that there's been a disinvestment, but just restructuring the schools uh, is not going to be the, the answer. So one of, the, one of the things I picked up in reading the book um, was the good job that Wando's going back in history and talking about prior progressive movements and things that happened uh, in those movements. Um, but it, it seemed to me that those movements didn't last. Uh, so I put the question to him when we were back in the so-called green, green room. Um, you know, is, it, is a progressive movement really a movement if it doesn't sustain itself? Uh, is there real value in it? And I thought his answer um, was just spot on and really got me to, to realize that how important a progressive movement is at a point in time. So you want to share that? Yeah, well, f first of all, I mean, I've been around social movements all my life, you know, all my adult life, right? Movements don't hold conventions, right? They don't uh, declare themselves. Uh, almost always a movement starts in one place with two or three people who say, we're fed up with this, we're not gonna take it, we gotta figure out some th to a way to do things better. Most of the time they don't succeed, but every once in a while they do. <laughs> you know? and, and when they do, they start looking around and they say, oh look, in that city over there, uh, some people with similar ideas, they won too. And look, over there, Somebody's got the same idea, and they're winning too. And then they start connecting. That's how movements start. Movements are organic. Movements, and also, they often don't have a clear organizational form. Uh, and that's why they're hard sometimes to identify in their, in their early stages. Once they mature a little bit, and they, get, and they start building their own organizations, uh, uh, then they become more identifiable. But I think what, what all social movements, the, the mo uh, movements I talk about, for instance, in the early 20th century, in the 19 teens and 20s, there was a, a strange alliance of American activists in that period. It was progressive Republicans, Bull Moose, you know, the Teddy Roosevelt, Bull Moose, anti-monopoly people, uh, progressive Republicans. There were farm labor Democrats, who were furious at the railroads uh, 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 controlling uh, rates for agricultural shipping of agricultural products and food. There were uh, socialists uh, and there were communists. And they fought a lot among themselves, but they also united around big issues. 
That was the progressive movement of the early 20th century. That progressive movement did wane. All movements wane because it's, a, it's the nature of a movement. It comes and it goes. It, it has a high tide and a low tide. Uh, but that doesn't mean they can't accomplish things. You know, the, that progressive movement in that period of time uh, created public utilities throughout the Midwest and the West, S municipally owned electric companies, and I think you got one here, right? <laughs> uh, and uh, I remember in Philadelphia, you had the Philadelphia Gas Works. You know, we had it was a, a city-owned, it was a city-owned gas works, uh, and um, uh, they, uh, they, they, they. Uh, managed to get direct election of U.S. senators, because before that period of time, U.S. senators were not directly elected. Uh, they managed to, uh, to get nonpartisan uh, elections in most of the, of the Midwest and the West, as opposed to what was, had happened in the East. Uh, so they actually accomplished important reforms that made democracy better in America. Uh, but then, you know, the depression comes and uh, FDR gets elected. So a segment of that progressive movement ends up going into the, the, uh, the New Deal. Uh, the more radical ones stay out because uh, the movements always divide that way between the practical reformers who want to institute legal remedies and those who don't want to deal with government, just want to criticize government. Uh, and, uh, and I think that um, uh, both are necessary, uh, but uh, both are necessary because eventually you have to have an implementation of your ideas and a concrete legal or administrator or other reform uh, to be able to uh, make it permanent. So I think that, that that progressive movement achieved a lot of stuff that helped the society move forward, but in the process it, it dissipated. <laughs> Uh, and I, you know, you can't, nothing lasts forever, you know, it's, nothing is guaranteed. Uh, but uh, you, that doesn't mean you don't fight and do the best you can at the moment that you are involved to make the society better than it was previously. So I su mm -hmm. So I noticed my friend David Rolf got uh, real fired up when we started this movement discussion. So I would just note that you know your description of movements being both practical and then sort of anti you know firebrand type. So Dave is kind of a chameleon. He does both, and I say that very complimentary because I think he is what he needs to be at the point in time. But as somebody who is very practical about getting results, uh, no, I think I, I love Juan's answer to that. I thought it was really textured and nuanced and accurate from a historical perspective, and I'm also both a movement leader, but also a student of movements and of history. And um, I, I would only say some things to add, uh, I think, to Juan's perspective. Um, you know, it's clearly true that movements don't have centralized addresses. They are not pyramid shaped. If one wished to have written a letter to the civil rights movement in 1965, where on earth would one have sent it? Uh, would one have sent it to uh, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference or to the SDS or to the Nation of Islam or to SNCC, uh, to, some, to Ebenezer Baptist Church in Atlanta? Where would one have addressed that letter? And I think that you know, if you look at the sometimes violent clashes between portions of the labor movement, between the early uh, republic and the 1930s when things kind of reached an equilibrium, you would see also no single address. So I think that that sort of chaotic and competitive, sometimes even violently competitive nature of social movements is sort of a characteristic of them. But I would also note that, you know, movements come in different flavors and types. When you look at something like the anti-Vietnam War movement, um, right, it had a specific objective. It ended a war. Right? And sort of the public rationale, there may have been a, a cadre of leaders who had a, a, the vision of a more peaceful planet, but the vast majority of movement participants had a single goal, which was to stop their friends from dying and their kids and the, and the kids of their parishioners at church. The, uh, and ACT UP New York, which you know, brought such attention to the AIDS crisis when the federal government wasn't funding AIDS research and when the President of the United States wouldn't even say the word AIDS or HIV, Right, it essentially achieved a set of victories. I mean, the New York Times wouldn't say it for a long time. Um, and then it sort of, its energy dissipated. 
the, the critical challenge of movements is always how do you take the movement energy, and I would say the, ter the, the lesson of the Arab Spring is nothing but this, right? Because uh, movements without institutional partners and without the ability to extract from the movement energy a permanent resource base and the ability to engage with government, engage with corporations, engage with other civic actors, almost always lose. And so when you find a movement that can express itself as a mature political institution in its next iteration, which arguably the labor movement of the 1930s did for a period of time, and a lot of sections of the civil rights movement, the women's movement, et cetera, did for periods of time, but which the Arab Spring colossally failed at. So they toppled regimes only to be replaced by even worse military dictatorships or by far right sort of uh, theocrats and or by just the breakdown of civil society because there wasn't a movement partner that could form institutional power. And the thing, the lesson for the left in America, which has historically defeated itself through factionalism and an ever-increasing desire for purity, is to ask who won the debate in the North African Catholic Church in the fourth century. Was it St. Augustine or was it the Donatists? No one here has ever heard of the Donatists before because they, so they became pure and secluded themselves against sin cloister themselves away from the world, and they were never heard of again. St. Augustine believed in preaching to the non-converted, meeting the world full of sinners where it was. I'm not religious at all, by the way. I just love history. And uh, as a result, that faction of the Catholic Church prevailed. So I, my caution to the left, to my brothers and sisters, is resist the temptation for purity and instead go out and meet the world where it is. Here, here. So the history of democracies around the world is, in general terms, they fail after about 200 years. <laughs> and they fail from within. They, they rarely fail because of some uh, external factors. So here we are sitting here around 250 years into this, this particular experiment. Uh, and at least until recently, you know, the magic of American democracy was uh, it, was, it was started by a handful of privileged white guys, but they created a construct that allowed the, 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 the participants to expand over time. Very imperfect, you know, a lot of injustice, but over time it kept expanding. So there was always hope, you know, I could, I could get better, I could get a job, I could get an ed ed education. So today, you know, what we're seeing is th with the fault lines so great, and most people don't even seem to understand that some of the this basic institution and the institutions that support democracy are are failing us. So you know, my my question is, when we think of the progressive movement and some other enlightened things that people are trying to do, can we save America? Can we save American democracy, or you know, are these just our death throes? It's an easy. It's an easy question. Well, Raise your hands. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I, I'm, I'm always an optimist, so I, I, I think uh, I would say that um, uh, we have to understand that yes, the country is a democracy, but it's also an imperial power, uh, and it, 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 the other people in other parts of the world look at the country in a different way, uh, and sometimes we fully understand. Uh, so, uh, so I think that um, uh, that uh, there is room to be able to change a good number of the policies that are are, uh, are now dominant uh, in uh, in American society. Uh, but it it will it's going to take a lot of struggle, and it's going to take not. It's also people should not be afraid of of. Uh, of a uh, an oppressive majority in terms of um, of the existing balance of forces in the society right now. I, I give one example of another one of these young progressives in uh, who's done a phenomenal stuff without having a majority. A young guy by the name of Wes uh, Bellamy. Uh, I met him just this past summer. He's not in my book because. Uh, 
I had already finished the book when I met him. <laughs> uh, but, <laughs> but Wes Bellamy is part of this group, Local Progress, that Nick Licata helped pull together, which is the now umbrella organization of all these some 600 progressive uh, elected officials around the country, and Lisa Herbold is a part of it, and, and, uh, and it's growing. It's growing rapidly. Anyway, so Wes Bellamy gets elected to this city council of Charlottesville, Virginia, a couple of years ago, the only African American on the city council. And Wes Bellamy is uh, he's a young guy. He's in his 30s. He's a school teacher. And, and it's not a full-time job in Charlottesville, obviously, but he's, he's on the city council. So Wes gets to the city council, and he says, I'm sick and tired of seeing that statue of Robert E. Lee downtown. We got to get rid of that statue. <laughs> and uh, the council says, you crazy? We're not going to get rid of that statue. You know, it's, uh, it'll be too much of a ruckus if we do that. So then... Uh, so Bellamy says, okay, you don't want to give me the statue? Give me a reparations package for the black community. Uh, and uh, and uh, he says, give me a fund for scholarships, for job training, uh, for, uh, uh, they changed the name, they called it an equity fund. But they actually gave it to him. They gave him uh, $8 million. Uh, and I said to myself, wow, that's a great idea. That's a great innovative idea, because all the talk I've heard about reparations has been at the national level. But there are so many cities in America that have huge African American populations and where the leadership of the city could actually implement uh, local reparations or equity packages, that that might be a, an idea with legs. So, uh, so Bellamy said, uh, I heard him speak at the local progress conference, and then he says, uh, not only that, but a few months after I got my equity package, a couple of the members, the white members of the city council, changed their minds and they agreed to vote with me to get rid of the statue of Robert E. Lee. So I got both of them. I got the equity package and I got the statue. But now I have a problem is that the KKK has already had one protest against me uh, over this and now they're coming back in a few weeks big time. Right? So I got back to New York and I told Amy, Amy, we got to get this guy, Wes Bellamy, on the show because, you know, he told me this great story and the Klan is coming to Charlottesville and we need to get him on the show beforehand. So we did. We got him on the show. And sure enough, Charlottesville blew up into a national, uh, a, a, a national uh, crisis. One person on a city council. That's it. One. One person who felt strongly enough about an issue that he was going to insist that people address his issue. And this is something Nick told me when I was interviewing him. He said, you don't need a majority. You just need a strong core. <laughs> you just need people with backbone. Uh, and you can force the, everyone else to deal with you. Uh, so I think that in a situation where the national governments and the state governments in America are now in uh, for the most part, with the exception of California. California is a different world. You know, California two weeks ago declared the entire state a sanctuary state. Right? <laughs> the entire state, not just, right? And uh, so uh, that in a situation where you have these reactionary forces in national government and local government for a lot of reasons, you know, for the federal nature of the Constitution, the Electoral College, voter suppression, gerrymandering, for a whole lot of reasons, the elected officials at the top do not reflect the real population of the country. Uh, but that's the world we live in. That's the, uh, so that we've got to deal with that. However, you can still fight. <laughs> you can still stand up. <laughs> you can still insist that these issues be dealt with. And eventually, you create teaching moments, like Charlottesville was a teaching moment in America, as the academics like to say. You know. I teach now because I at Rutgers, so I guess I'm an academic too. You know, uh, it's a teaching moment, right? And there will be other teaching moments where the entire society is confronted with an issue that some people feel so strongly about that they're going to have to think about it some more, uh, and they're going to have to try to, like, uh, refine their positions uh, on that particular issue. So I think that don't worry about the top <laughs> right now. Yes. It's sucking up all the air, but build the base at, in the cities. Build the base in the cities. You know, as, as Bernie Sanders said after he lost, 
run for office yourself. <laughs> Right. Run for office yourself, run for school board, run for city council, you know, and, uh, and start building the base uh, in, in tandem with these grassroots movements of which there are many. We're going to save democracy, David. I am also an eternal optimist. Um, and my lived experience is that when ordinary people unite together, they can accomplish extraordinary things. There is no reason why home care workers who are invisible and powerless and unbenefited and misclassified, making the minimum wage with no benefits a decade and a half ago, now make between $15 and $18 an hour with health care, pensions, training, certification, mileage reimbursement, paid time off here in Washington State, the best success story in that industry in the country, except that people got united and demanded change. And uh, together, through their union, adopted strategies to say that they're going to take what is rightfully theirs and they're no longer going to accept a vow of poverty for providing life-sustaining work for the frailest humans in our society. So, and, and again and again, in my experience... That's I've worth an applause. Right, thank you, <laughs> thank you. Again and, again and again, whether it's the fight for 15, uh, whether it's the marriage equality fight, whether it's, uh, I mean, we could go on and on. Like, I think there are almost no examples of significant domestic policy innovation in American history that weren't ultimately fueled by uh, movements that interacted with and reflected how sta state, first, almost always, state and local policy change before federal policy change. So I think that, you know, my lived experience is, is that, the, that the invisible can, in fact, become invincible, and the powerless can become powerful through organization. Uh, but... I believe it's also true that we've never experienced in human history the level of wealth concentration and concentration of power that we see right now. I mean, right, you are uh, in some ways a canary in the coal mine on the issue of media concentration and the ownership of who controls what information that people have access to every day, right? Um, the, the amount of, I mean, the, the amount of wealth that just a handful of families hold now and, and and use daily to protect their political power, is, it's, it's mind-numbing. I mean, people, few, fewer people in the entire country than we can see in either of these stadiums down here, you, you know, control something approaching 50% of all the wealth in America, uh, knocking on the door of 50%. And so when you have that panoptic level of concentration of wealth and power, so that if seeing a handful of billionaires can actually not just contribute unlimited sums of dark money to elections, but actually contribute unlimited sums of dark money to manipulate what you see on your social media feed so that the people you believe are your friends are posting news articles you then click on, and as a result, we create an opinion bubble where somehow, literally, at some point last year, a double-digit percentage of Americans believed, courtesy of a guy named Robert Mercer and a firm called Cambridge Analytica, that uh, Hillary Clinton and John Podesta were running a child sex slave ring out of a pizzeria in Northwest Washington, right? It sounds like if you'd set that, if you were a fiction writer and you sent that to your editor, you'd get a big reject stamp back because they'd say, you can know when it's gonna suspend disbelief long enough to follow this plot line, but yet nevertheless, the power of big money, big tech applied to information science and sort of weaponized artificial intelligence, in fact, influenced our elections in a number of ways we can now say for sure happen. So I think that, um, uh, you know, yes, I, I think we, we do intuitively know that, um, you know, you can have power because you control armies, or because you control wealth, or because you have a large number of people acting with strength and unity together in civic affairs. And that's the only tool we got. That's the only shot we have. Um, but I think that we are now facing forces and enemies that are stronger than any we faced in the history of our country. And that if, in fact, we want both a healthy democracy and a growing, inclusive, and prosperous middle class that powers that democracy forward. We are at a strategic inflection point that future generations will look back to our generation and ask where were we when the fight was real and when the time came. So I guess we're kind of an unusual panel because uh, from our own prisms, we have all really looked hard at fault lines and the problems with America and what's broken. Um, and yet, we're three very optimistic people. And I don't know if there's a personality quirk we have or what, but 
Juan, before we go to questions, uh, this whole issue of the FCC being co-opted, the media consolidation in newspapers, radio, TV, Sinclair, Facebook and Google's obscene control of, of the internet and information. Um, I mean, you, your career has been, been in media and, and as a journalist. Do you have any thoughts on that? I wrote a whole book about it, <laughs> uh, but it's uh, and it's already out of date because of all the stuff that's changing. But um, uh, you know, I think that um, uh, clearly uh, the issue of uh, the narrative of who, who who produces the narrative, how how it's disseminated, uh, and how it's critically consumed by people is is. Uh, is a constant, has been a constant battle in, uh, throughout American history. Uh, the real problem we have today is I believe um, that, um, yes, there are efforts now by the FCC. The FCC is almost like, uh, the FCC is so slow to act. Uh, it, it really can't deal with the changing nature of the, uh, of the media landscape uh, in America and around the world. You know, I was just telling Frank before we uh, we got uh, uh, we got up here that you know I teach journalism now, right? So I had 29 students in in my last class in the spring, and um, I'd give them a media quiz at the beginning of every class just to see how they consume media. Now these are journalism majors, juniors and seniors uh, at, at Rutgers University, and. Um, they don't read newspapers. One of the 29 claimed to read a daily newspaper, uh, the New York Times, but they said that, because I asked them how often do you read it, you know, and each question, they said they, they read it once a week, which means they don't read it. <laughs> uh, and it's a daily newspaper. Uh, and uh, they don't watch TV, they don't watch cable news, uh, but then I have the social media questions. Uh, how do you, uh, what social media sites do you use? Uh, how often? Once a day, three times a day, 10 times a day. 23 out of the 29 students went on Facebook 10 times a day or more. They get all their information on social media. And now we have the problem as we're finding more and more about the trolls and the, and the automated systems of, of managing the trending stories on, uh, on, on Twitter and Facebook. Facebook is the most powerful media company in the world today. <laughs> you know, and, and, uh, because uh, they got a, what, billion, a billion and change? Uh, uh, and uh, and uh, that's how people are getting their news and information. But as you said, they don't even read the whole article that their friends send them. They just read the headline. <laughs> They just read the. Uh, they don't even bother to read the whole st the whole article, but it's still it's a closed circle because it's only those people that 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 send you the stuff. Uh, so um, uh, there has to be some sort of accountability of these platforms uh, for, uh, and that's going to be the tough question: uh, the accountability of the platforms for their product, <laughs> for what they're putting out there. Uh, and um, uh, and I think that the ownership issue, because the other big issue, and we're in Seattle, so let's let's say it: the digital uh, the digital giants have a far worse record when it comes to uh, racial integration than do the old legacy media, radio, television, and print. We're lucky to get 12 to 14 percent African Americans, Latinos, and Native Americans. Uh, Google, Facebook, and Twitter combined, last time I looked out of their 40,000 employees, 1.9% were African American. Uh, and uh, uh, the issue of the racial, the racial nature of these, uh, of these new media giants, uh, in addition to, the, to how much information they're not, con they're not controlling, has got to be addressed. You cannot create, you know, the people who are creating the algorithms, the people who are working in these media companies, they've got to open up. They've got to be integrated. Uh, and um, uh, so I think that, um, uh, that we've got a big, uh, a big job ahead of us, those of us who are still journalists, in terms of providing the American people with the kind of news and information that they can, 
function uh, in the best way possible as citizens. Uh, but we, we have to uh, continue to fight against the Sinclairs. But the, the Sinclair, that's a problem. This TV is a problem, especially local news. But to me, the bigger problem is what's going on with uh, social media and with the fake news and with the, uh, and with the dominance of social media as the main form of information that people are getting today. So I think we're ready for questions. We are. We have uh, just about 10 or 15 minutes, but we'd love to hear some questions from the audience. I'd particularly love to hear from some women who have not been on stage today. Um, if you have a question, um, please come up to this microphone so we can all hear you in the room and pick you up for the archival recording we're making tonight. If anyone's brave enough to come up for a first question. <laughs> Uh, Juan, you mentioned how uh, like the three different types of press uh, historically, um, that's sort of a new information for me, and it seems like some of the topics that the minority press and that the progressive press and sort of the more uh, adversarial press, uh, some of the values that both would be fighting for historically would be a more aligned, a more, more con congruent. Um, can you maybe ex uh, explain why there's a divergence um, and how come the two perhaps didn't envelop and become one uh, and sort of unite their forces and to combat for similar causes. You mean between the uh, uh, the dissident press and the press by people of color? Yes. Yeah. Uh, well, that's a. Uh, it, I'll do it really quickly. First of all, the working men's press of the 1830s, as well as the muckrakers, uh, were really bad on uh, on racial issues, largely because the working men's press gradually adopted uh, a. Um, uh, a territorial expansion view. Workers, you know, go west, young man. You know, get get out of the cities, go west. To go west, they had to, they had to uh, continue to dominate and conquer Native Americans and Mexicans and and other and justify it by saying that they were uh, semi civilized. Uh, and uh, so the reality is that the working men's press and even the muckrakers, the muckrakers were not good on the issues on issues of race, with the exception of Ray Standard Baker, who did a, a bunch of series on the color line. Uh, but, um, uh, but I think uh, basically the, it, uh, the progressive press until the 70s really didn't begin to open up in a big way. There were some in the communist and socialist press in the 30s and 40s, but the real opening up uh, of both the uh, the radical press and the corporate and commercial press did not come about until the 1970s. For the f f between the 1700s <laughs> and uh, the 1970s, uh, largely the dissident press in America and the corporate and commercial press were largely a white press. Uh, and uh, it's, it would take longer than we have time here for me to give you the, the specifics of it. I have a slightly uh, lighter question. Uh, last week, Mayor de Blasio spoke out against the New York Yankees. He said he doesn't root for the Yankees. He's from Boston. So a, a two-part question, which uh, or What a brave statement to make, right? <laughs> Listen, I was, I was raised in the Bronx in the 70s by a Yankee hater. My 91-year-old dad to this day celebrates when the Yankees don't win. So sure. my question is, was, do you think that that statement or his taking that position was reflective of class division? And to what extent are a city's tensions um, uh, made manifest uh, through their professional sports teams? Well, um, you got the man who drove the su supersonics out, out of town, right? <laughs> right here. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, uh, but, uh, well, clearly, well, first of all, de Blasio, I have to hand it to him. It took a lot of nerve to do that, you know, to, uh, <laughs> because you, you understand the Yankees and the Red Sox, they're like arch enemies, right? For, for him to say he wasn't rooting for the Yankees and not to go to any Yankee games. Uh, he took a big hit on that. Uh, but, uh, so I got to give him, I got to give him credit for, for bravery on that one. Uh, uh, on the issue of, uh, so I don't, I don't think it was a class thing on his part, part. It's just that's the way he was raised. He was raised in Boston, and and so he's a diehard Boston, uh, Boston fan. Uh, and uh, but uh, 
but I think that the issue of the sports stadiums, I mean, I, in my book, I go into how our cities got to be where they are today. Uh, the whole urban growth machine model uh, that has dominated urban policy in America. And basically, the proponents, and they're both Democrats and Republicans on this issue, uh, uh, believe that urban space and land should be maximized to the, to the most profit that you can make off land. Because obviously, there's a limited supply of land in the city. Uh, so, um, uh, so the urban growth machine believes in luxury development, commercial development, sports stadiums, you know, that whole downtown development model. Uh, and, uh, but those who believe that si public commons, public spaces, schools and streets should serve the residents of the city and should make their lives better, uh, they are the, 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 uns the folks who have been unspoken for in urban policy in America now for, for decades. And, uh, and that is a class question because clearly the development model does spur gentrification especially once uh, America decided to follow the European model of kicking all the poor out of the inner cities and sticking them in the suburbs someplace and, and, uh, and bringing the middle and upper classes back into the central cities. So that's become a class issue everywhere. And I think that's the number one issue in urban America today is where will the people live? You know, where will the people live? Uh, and that is a class issue because it's largely the working class and the middle class that can't afford it anymore. In New York City today, one third of all the renters in New York City pay more than 50% of their income in rent. One third, they are only working to pay their landlords. That's what they're working for. Uh, you cannot sustain that. Uh, you can't sustain it in Seattle, you can't sustain it in Chicago, you can't sustain it in San Francisco, in Boston, in all these places. Something has to be done to make these cities livable for working people, uh, for the middle class. Uh, and that is the, I think that's the key class question right now, uh, in, uh, other than raising the income levels overall, but then the issue is housing, affordable housing. How do you build it in a situation where the federal government and the state governments have abandoned any responsibility? Back in 1968, President Johnson created a commission on the cities uh, that produced a, a report. This is separate from the current commission. And, and that's it. that commission said in 1968, the private sector left to its own will never build low-cost housing. Never, <laughs> right? Because why should they? <laughs> you know, when all they got to do is build the same structure with the same piping and the same electricity, put granite countertops and doormen outside, and you could charge three times, three times or four times as much. So they'll never do it. You have to have government involvement. So I, I sympathize with the progressives at the city level who are now saying, what are we going to do? How are we going to do this? We know we got to build affordable housing, but the federal government is out of it. The state government is out of it. What kind of deal can we make with the developers <laughs> uh, to get them to build a little bit more crumbs of affordable housing? Uh, because, but we have to have a systemic, systemic approach to low-cost housing in the cities. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. That was a wonderful list of uh, uh, leaders developing in various cities that you uh, covered at the beginning and then all this discussion about movements and uh, in current movements in the US and history. I'm wondering about the connection between the two and, and maybe the way to phrase the question is when de Blasio is gone or term limits or moves on or dies or whatever, is there, will there be a movement left to elect the next de Blasio or apply that to any one of the cities or, or leaders, very progressive leaders you said, to what extent are they at heads of movement and what extent will the next person come along when they've moved on? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. That's whether the movement becomes more institutionalized and, and, uh, and that's, uh, uh, that's not guaranteed. It's obviously, it's a question of the, you know, will the leadership and the, and, and the organizations that are backing them figure out in a depth manner to develop su succession plans, <laughs> you know, and to, and to uh, 
because de Blasio is about to get reelected. I mean, it is, he's, he, there's no chance that he's not, I don't think that he's not going to get reelected. But that's only another four years, and, uh, and what happens then? Uh, so I think that, uh, and of course, you all see, see what happened here. Yeah, well, this was this was the only one of the class of 2013 that <laughs> didn't make it, uh, and uh, uh, the the mayor here. But you know everybody has their their demons, you know, and and uh, so um, uh, so uh, uh, Mr. Murray's demons got to him, and and uh, so um, but the rest of them, for the most part, look like they're going to move on to a second term, and then the question is what happens after that. I think it's a great, great question. I think that we should make a fundamental distinction between political leaders who seek elected office for themselves and movements and, and institutions. Those are three separate categories. And it is true that a movement leader or an institutional leader can go on to become a political leader, right? I mean, look at Lula in Brazil, I mean, probably most famously among current world leaders. Um, but you know, a rich history in a lot of Northern Europe of union leaders becoming members of parliament and ultimately heads of state, for example. Um, but I think the mistake we make is we fall victim to this sort of right-wing Hegelian great man theory of history where we believe that some charismatic left leader is going to be is like the same thing as institution building. V voting for Bernie, voting for your favorite mayoral candidate, voting for Barack Obama is different than movement building. That's choosing a government. And that is different than the hard work of getting in the trenches and building permanent institutions capable of holding governments accountable, even friendly ones. And so I think that it is this sometimes uh, category error that we make in pro amongst progressives in believing that simply because someone comes along and has access to a microphone and is competing for a nomination or a, a governorship or a mayorship or whatever, that they're a movement leader. That's not the movement. That's the candidate the movement temporarily is, chooses to ally itself with, but then has to equally be willing to hold accountable once in office. And I think that's uh, too many times we make the mistake of following the charismatic leader and not actually getting into the trenches and building real movements and real institutions. Thanks. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. My concern is fake news. And my concern is that um, everybody's so upset about all the, the Russian influence and, oh, we're going to take all these actions about Russia and Twitter's going to pay attention to the ads from Russia and so is Facebook and all this stuff. But how do we really get the truth out in America when we have this thing called, you know, the First Amendment and so far, People like Fox News, Rush Limbaugh, Breitbart, Bannon are allowed to do this, and no one's even thinking about going after them. And them, and I think we're losing our democracy because the media is sort of like false equivalency with these fake news sites. So I just wondered what your thoughts were about that. You want to answer? You want well, to <laughs> <laughs> you're the most <laughs> obvious. Yeah. You know the good thing to be in my position is I can answer the question I want, not the one you ask. But <laughs> oh, okay. But I, but I, but, but, I, but I, I'll, it's very close to it. Uh, about a month ago, Seattle Times held one of our live wire series on fake news, and we brought in some remarkable experts, some that work in Africa, trying to uh, develop real news and news literacy in you know the most remote parts of Africa. Uh, the the, uh, uh, the 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 Facebook piece is what is really <laughs> scary. I mean, something like 50 percent, and I think I'm understating this now. 50 percent of all people are now saying that they're getting their news from Facebook, at their primary source of news. And when you then ask them, say, okay, well that's your that's the where you're getting it. Who produced it? And they say, well, Facebook. So they don't even know who's, who's producing it. And then something like 40, 45% of people who forward a Facebook story have never read it. So, you know, there, there's, a, there's a responsibility for people who consume news, but there's also a responsibility for us. We should be outraged that, uh, that Google and Facebook have been allowed to control our information the way they do. 
And, and if you're in my business, they are using all our information, and we never get paid a dime for it. We don't even get credit for it. So they're undermining the people that actually are willing to spend money to produce qual quality content. Um, but and and Juan said something you know really interesting about the FCC moves so slowly, and can't get their arms around what's what's going on, and they can't. Um, you hope that what comes out of this last election is that there's a political will that that uh, we start exercising some control on the internet and some restrictions on Google and Facebook. Um, I mean, just think how obscene that is. Facebook's out there with ad sales people soliciting Russians t t and helping them write fake ads to try to influence our elections. Facebook people don't care who gets elected, they just want the money. You know, the Russians, they seem to have an interest in who gets elected. Either way, boy, you talk about something that's da danger dangerous for, for democracy. Um, so I don't know that that's directly to your question, but it is a huge, huge I issue. Agree. I agree. Okay. Thanks. Well, you have an answer, a different no, that's, answer. That's, that's fine. All right. <laughs> Oh, what a, what a group. All right, thank you so much. Thank you. Frank Blethin, David Rolfe, Juan Gonzalez. Thank you all for being here. Uh, one good solution is buy wonderful books from independent booksellers produced by wonderful independent publishers like the New Press at the LA Bay table over there and subscribe to your local family-owned newspaper. <laughs> thank you.